continue this morning with our study of the gospel according to St. Mark. And we are in the sixth chapter, and today I will read beginning at verse 45 and reading through verse 56. Mark chapter 6, verses 45 to 56. I'll ask the congregation to stand for the reading of the Word of God. Immediately He made His disciples get into the boat and go before Him to the other side, to Bethsaida, while He sent the multitude away. And when He sent them away, He departed to the mountain to pray. Now when evening came, the boat was in the middle of the sea and he was alone on the land. And then he saw them straining at rowing, for the wind was against them. Now about the fourth watch of the night he came to them, walking on the sea, and would have passed them by. And when they saw him walking on the sea, they supposed it was a ghost, and they cried out, for they all saw him and were troubled. But immediately he talked with them and said to them, Be of good cheer, it is I. Do not be afraid. And then he went up into the boat to them, and the wind ceased. And they were greatly amazed in themselves beyond measure and marveled. For they had not understood about the loaves, because their heart was hardened. And when they had crossed over, they came to the land of Gennesaret and anchored there. And when they came out of the boat, immediately the people recognized Him, ran through that whole surrounding region, and began to carry about on beds those who were sick, wherever they heard He was. And wherever He entered into villages, cities, or the country, they laid the sick in the marketplaces and begged Him that they might just touch the hem of His garment. And as many as touched Him were made well." The Word of God, inspired, infallible, inerrant. Please be seated. Let us pray. O Lord, as we once again give attention to this record of the life, the person, and the work of our Savior. We pray that in understanding this episode this morning, that we will go even deeper into our wonder and awe of the mystery of His person. For we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I find there's an interesting segue here in Mark's gospel between the account that he gives us of Jesus' feeding of the 5,000 with the loaves and the fish that we examined last week, and then moving to this astonishing account of his walking on the water. But that segue that links these two accounts is not without importance. And so I'd like to spend just a few moments looking at that transition that links these two events. Verse 45, we read, immediately He made His disciples get into the boat and go before Him to the other side, to Bethsaida while He sent the multitude away." Now, Mark doesn't tell us why Jesus so abruptly, immediately upon the conclusion of this feasting of the multitudes upon the fish and the loaves, why Jesus virtually curtly dismisses the disciples, sends them on their way, puts them into the boat, tells them to go aside the Bethsaida while He would stay and dismiss the crowd. Again, Mark doesn't tell us why, 
But I don't think it's really too hard to speculate why, particularly when we see a little comment at the end of this segment of the text. And that is that one thing that Jesus really had to struggle with was that every time He performed a miracle, particularly when there were large crowds, the people would begin to press upon Him, want to anoint Him as their King, look to Him to be the warrior deliverer from the oppression which was of Rome. And it seems on this occasion that crowd response was so strong that apparently the disciples themselves got caught up in it. And Jesus sees this. He sees that they're as excited as the crowd is, and they're looking to Him with that glaze in their eyes that maybe Jesus will be the one to drive the Romans out of the land. And so He says, you're out of here. You get in the boat. I'll see you later. You go to the other side, to Bethsaida, which means the house of the fisher. And so after dismissing the disciples, then Jesus, by Himself, dismisses the crowd. And obviously, in His own way, He put to rest any spontaneous moves to make Him king. Now, I make these speculations based on a host of events that take place sprinkled throughout the earthly ministry of Jesus that consistent with the normal response and Jesus' response to the crowd's response, and I guess that that's probably what happened here. But again, as I said, if you can be patient for a few minutes, I think that speculation will be somewhat satisfied at the end of the text. Well, then after dismissing the crowd, what does Jesus do? He removes Himself from the crowd, goes away into a solitary place to pray. Now, there's nothing particularly unique about that. Obviously, Jesus was a man of prayer, but you may be surprised to learn that there are only three times in the Bible that specifically describe Jesus in prayer. And what I find noteworthy about those occasions is that in every one of those times that the Bible talks about Jesus praying, He's alone, withdrawn into a solitary place, away from the crowds, away from the disciples. And when He is alone like this, as He was in the Garden of Gethsemane, as He was when He spent the night praying before He called the disciples, there is some crisis pressing in upon Him. And that crisis usually has something to do with His vocation, with His mission. The first time it was the choosing of the disciples that would accompany Him in this mission. This time, and then the third time, as I said, was in Gethsemane, when the heart of His mission was directly in front of Him with that cup that the Father had filled with His own wrath. But here, Jesus withdraws, gets away from the crowd, away from His disciples, and spends a long time in prayer, obviously, about His mission. Now when evening came, the boat was in the middle of the sea, and He was alone on the land. And then He saw them straining at rowing, for the wind was against them. Now about the fourth watch of the night He came to them walking on the sea, and would have passed them by." Now, there's enough in this verse to last for the next few weeks, but God willing, I'll move at an accelerated pace and try to finish it this morning. But while He is out coming down from the mountain of prayer, He looks out into the Sea of Galilee, and in the distance He can see that His disciples have made very little progress in getting to the other side because there is a fierce wind blowing against them, 
And Jesus observes that they are straining at the oars. They can't sail across the turbulent waters at this time, and they're trying to do it with oars, rowing. And when he notices them, the word that is used here, translated straining elsewhere in the Bible, is translated by the word torment. That the pain that they were experiencing trying to row against this wind was excruciating. In all probability, it was an easterly wind known to the natives as the sharkia, or in English would be the shark. This is the New Testament's version of Jaws, only the shark is a wind rather than a fish, but the end result could often be the same. And so now Jesus sees that His disciples are in trouble, and He begins to leave the land, to walk out to them, and He walks on the sea. Let me just comment on that for a second. Again, the language here in the text makes no mistake about what Mark is saying that the word there means on top of the water, that clearly Jesus is doing something that no mortal is able to do. Last week I mentioned the 19th century assault on the integrity of Scripture by European liberals who de-supernaturalized the biblical text. These same scholars, as noted by Albert Schweitzer in The Quest for the Historical Jesus, explain this particular incident of saying, well, it must have been misty that night with the wind churning up the water, and Jesus is out there in the fourth watch, which is between three o'clock in the morning, six o'clock in the morning. And so in the fog, the disciples suffer an optical illusion. Or, more possible, there was a sandbar hidden from view. And Jesus was taking advantage of that sandbar to walk out to meet the disciples who are in the middle of the lake that they know as well as the palm of their hand, that they know where every shoal, where every rock, where every sandbar would be. Nevertheless, the one thing that the 19th century critic couldn't stomach is even the remote possibility that what Mark describes here actually took place. No sandbar no optical illusion, but rather Jesus walking on the water. Now, notice something strange here in this description. In about the fourth watch of the night, He came to them walking on the sea and would have passed them by. Stop the music. And Jesus sees they're in trouble, straining at the oars, they're in physical torment. The wind is howling, the shark is loose on the sea. And so Jesus starts out on the water to pass them by, just to walk past the boat and say, how are you doing? <laughs> Have a nice night and keep on going to the… What's that about? Why would the description be here in the text? that Jesus purposes to walk by them. Well, you know, one of the basic principles that we have of biblical interpretation is that you interpret the Scriptures by the Scriptures. And if we want to get a hold of what the text is about here, we have to go back to the Old Testament to understand this phenomenon. In the first place, we understand that it It's in the book of Job where the Scriptures say that it is God who walks upon the waves. And in Jewish understanding, indeed in all human understanding, the only one who has the power or ability to walk on water is God Himself. And when God manifests Himself in the Old Testament in a visible way, that visible manifestation of the invisible God is called a theophany, coming from the Greek word theos, which means God, 
and from the Greek word phanaros, which means to manifest or show or demonstrate or display. So a theophany is, again, a visible manifestation of the invisible God. You've heard of other theophanies when Moses sees the burning bush in the Midianite wilderness where the bush is burning but not consumed, and God speaks to Moses out of that bush. That's a theophany, a visible appearance of the invisible God. In Genesis, when Abraham is given the promise of his inheritance, and he says to God, how can I know that these things are true? And God put him to sleep and cut up all these animals, and the smoking torch and and the burning oven pass between the pieces of these animals. It's a theophany. It's God visibly moving to show Himself. But perhaps the two most famous theophanies like this in the Old Testament are found in the book of Exodus and in the book of 1 Kings. First of all, let me look at Exodus chapter 33. Moses is speaking to God, and he says in verse 18 of chapter 33 of Exodus, Lord, please show me your glory. And God said, notice this, I will make all of my goodness pass before you. I will proclaim the name of the Lord before you, and I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious. I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. But he said, you cannot see my face, for no man shall see me and live. And then the Lord said, here's a place by me, and you shall stand on the rock. And so shall it be that while my glory passes by, that I will put you in the cleft of the rock and will cover you with my hand while I pass by. Then I will take away my hand. You shall see my back, but my face shall not be seen." Now, you're aware of this story. We've looked at it in other circumstances. Again, for review, what does Moses want? He wants to see God. Please, please, Lord, show me your glory. And three times in the response to this request, God says to Moses words to this effect, Moses, I will let all of my goodness pass by you. I will stand you in the rock. I will hide you in the rock. I will put you in the cleft of the rock, and I will have my glory pass by you. And I will let you see my backward parts as I pass by you, but my face shall not be seen. You notice now that in this theophany, even as in the Genesis 15 passage I mentioned a moment ago, when God moves with His glory to show Himself to creatures, His glory passes by. And that's what Jesus is saying, I'm going out to the boat I'm going to walk on the water that I might pass by them. Jesus is self-consciously involved here in a theophany. One more example. Let's look in 1 Kings, another familiar text. The story of Elijah as he flees from Jezebel and he hides in a cave, verse 9, chapter 19. And there he went into a cave and spent the night in that place, and behold, the word of the Lord came to him, and he said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? And so Elijah said, I've been very zealous for the Lord God of hosts, but the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant, they've torn down your altars. They've killed your prophets with the sword, and I alone 
am left. This I call the Elijah syndrome that many of us experience from time to time. We think we're the only ones left who are faithful. And now they seek to take my life. Now, how does God respond to this expression of despair by His prophet? Listen to what God said. God said, go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord, and behold, the Lord passed by. And a great and strong wind tore into the mountains, broke the rocks in pieces before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still, small voice. So it was. When Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood in the entrance of the cave. And suddenly a voice came to him and said, what are you doing here, Elijah? And he said, I've been very zealous for the Lord God, but because the children of Israel have forsaken their covenant, torn down the altars, killed your prophets with the sword, I alone am left, and they seek to take my life. God said, go and return to the wilderness Damascus, and when you arrive, anoint Haziel as king over Syria, anoint Jehu the son of Nimshi as king over Israel, and Elisha the son of Shaphat of Abel, you shall anoint his prophet in your place, and it shall be that whoever escapes the sword of Haziel, Jehu will kill. Whoever escapes the sword of Jehu, Elisha will kill. But I have reserved 7,000 who have not yet bowed the knee to Baal. So don't talk to me about being alone. I always have a remnant who are faithful to me. But in that crisis encounter, Elijah experienced the theophany as the glory of the Lord passed by. And that's what happens here on the Sea of Galilee, where the glory of God bursting through the shroud of the humanity of Jesus manifests itself to the disciples in the middle of their distress. They look, and they see the glory of God passing by. The glory of the Lord shining out of the Son of God passing by. And when they saw him walking on the sea, they supposed it was a ghost, or the word could mean a phantom, or even worse, the word could be demon, because there were superstitious ideas that the sea, when it was churning and boiling, that it was the result of the visitation of the demonic world upon this destructive force. So now when they see Jesus, they say, this must be a demon. Well, they knew it was something supernatural, but it wasn't a phantom. It wasn't a ghost. It wasn't a demon. It was Jesus coming to them, walking by them. And they all saw him, and they were troubled, but immediately he talked with them, and he said to them, listen to this, this is not just an empty greeting. They hear him speak, and he says, be of good cheer. It is I. Don't be afraid. Now, many of you were here when we preached through the entire gospel of John. And one of the things that we paid close attention to in our study of John's gospel were the several I am's of Jesus, you recall. I am the bread of life. I am the good shepherd. I am the door. 
I am the way, the truth, or the life, and before Abraham was, I am, and so on. And when we looked at the structure of those proclamations by Jesus, we found something extraordinary, that when a person says, I am, in Greek, he can do it one of two ways. He can say, ego. We get the word ego from that, which means I am. Or we get the word emi, which is another form of the verb to be, I am. But we find this strange construction in the gospel of John, in John's I am's, where when Jesus says, I am the good shepherd, I am the door, and so on, I am the resurrection and the life, he combines ego and emi and uses that intensified form of the verb to be, where he says, ego emi. It's like he's stuttering, I am, I am. But he's not stuttering. He's using an expression that the New Testament Greek uses to translate the ineffable name of God that God gives to Moses from the burning bush when God said, my name is Yahweh. I am that I am. When the Greek translates Yahweh, it's by that strange conjunction of ego, emi. Now, when we think of the I am's, we think of John's gospel. But Mark has one of the I am's of Jesus, because now, as he passes by, walking on the sea, and his disciples are terrified. He tries to calm their spirits. Be of good cheer. Don't be afraid. Ego emi. I am. If there was any doubt earlier that what was going on here was a theophany, Jesus' use of the sacred name to identify Himself as He's walking on the water makes that virtually certain. But then we have to ask the question, why did He do that? Well, again, here we don't have to speculate. He went into the boat. As soon as He goes into the boat, the wind ceased, just like it did earlier when He calmed the storm. And they were greatly amazed at themselves beyond measure, and they marveled. Now, here's the verse I spoke about twice, that if you were patient, I would get to. So here we are. For they had not understood about the loaves. They didn't get it. What should they have understood? They should have understood that the one with whom they had to do was God incarnate. Who else could take a few loaves and some fish and feed thousands and thousands of people? But instead of seeing the presence of God, they saw the presence of a liberator from the military oppression of Rome. They didn't get it. And why didn't they get it? Earlier in the service, we continued our reading through the book of Exodus, where Moses and Aaron come to Pharaoh and say, Pharaoh, we're going to tell you again what the Lord God has commanded. He told us to tell you, let my people go, that they may come out into the wilderness and serve me. But Pharaoh said no. Why? Because his heart was hard. And when they threw down the rod of Aaron and the Nile turned into blood and the fish died and the river began to stink and the, the water could not be drunk, and not only there but in every well, every river, every brook, 
every bowl, every glass of water in the land turned to blood. Now, if you're Pharaoh and you see that, what do you say? Where do you want him to go? How long would you like to stay? Surely this is God. But his heart was hardened. Beloved, when people don't get it about the identity of Christ, it's not because they don't have any brains. It's not because they're unintelligent. It's because their hearts are recalcitrant. Their hearts are made out of stone. That sin causes so great calluses to grow upon our hearts that when if Christ Himself would walk in front of us on the water today, unless the Holy Spirit changes that heart of stone to one that can beat and pulsate with spiritual life, people will not believe. And so Jesus makes it unmistakably clear. You didn't get it when I fed the 5,000. You don't get it when I tell you, ego emi. You don't get it when I step into the boat and the wind stops blowing and the shark becomes a minnow. It's because your hearts are hardened. And then when they crossed over, they came to the land of Genesaret, and they anchored there. They came out of the boat, and all again, the story repeats, the people recognize him. They go running through the whole region. They go to the Agora, to the marketplace. They bring their sick. They bring their lame. They bring their oppressed, just in the hope that if Jesus passes by, if they can just touch the hem of his garment, they would be healed. As they understood in those villages what we sang about this morning, that when Jesus went to Genesaret, surely the Lord was in that place. And when we know the presence of the Lord, we stop straining at the oars. We are removed from our torment, and we are left in a state of awe and reverence before Him. Let's pray. Oh God, we thank You for these manifold records where You have allowed Your glory to pass by, veiled, enigmatic, hidden, mysterious, yet powerful enough to awaken the eyes of Abraham, to stun the soul of Moses, to quiet the agony of Elijah, to still the fears of the disciples on the lake. We thank You for these accounts of Your visible manifestation of Your invisible glory. Amen.